We took along Dr. William Bell, a local clinical psychologist who is an advocate for the elderly. Dr. Bell had visited the Godwin home several times. He told us the place was overcrowded, the patients had no privacy, and he introduced us to an 82-year-old woman who complained the rodents outnumbered the home's residents. I was watching TV out here one night with the fellow that lived here, and all of a sudden I felt something on my foot, and I jumped and screamed, and there was a mouse sitting there. He says, oh, hell no, a rat? I said, sitting up on my foot. You can see them any time back here on the dining area floor. They have a ball back there because there's lots of crumbs. Mrs. Martindale also told us that some of her belongings stored in the home's basement had been burglarized, and she showed us where she had patched a hole in her floor with tape. Down the hall, we found bed linen, which had not been changed in several months. I don't care what you put in front of me. I want some seasoning in it. And we spoke Ain't with no other problem. residents no who complained pepper, about no the home's food. Like after our visit, we spoke with Dr. Bell about his impressions of the Godwin home. Things are totally neglected uh, from my viewpoint. Uh, there are very little or no supervision. Uh, they have people just released from uh, Central State Hospital, I understand, mixed with, with people who are just placed there solely because they're elderly and, and, and can't take care of themselves. Uh, with no professional training, there's not even a psychiatric nurse there. Uh, it's shocking to me, and I'm not easily aroused, but when I saw this, I couldn't, I said something has to be done. How does this home uh, stack up as what you think a uh, room and boarding home should be? Okay. Here in Oklahoma City, what I've told and I've talked to the people from the health department to make the investigations, we are one of the better ones. That's what they've told me. So I act truthfully have not been in any other room and board facilities. This is the first one I've had an association with or anything to work with. Uh, so I feel, you know, it's, it has a lot of room for a lot of improvements to be made. And like I said, the company's working and striving, you know, to make those improvements and get them done as quickly as possible. Mrs. Martindale, how would you characterize the living conditions in this boarding house? Existence. You just exist from day to day. As if strewn about by an angry child, 17 rail cars lay twisted and broken north of Edmond. On the ground, the site is much more striking. The twisted wreckage is being cleared at this hour by Santa Fe work crews. While it's still there, many people decided to come see firsthand what it looked like. Look at all the red, the red stuff up there. Uh, that's just amazing. 14 the cars. It's a lot of cars. Linda and Richard Stark were among the many to see the derailment in person tonight. And like everybody, they had their own comments and questions. I wonder how much all this would cost. Just be carrying all these trains. I can believe that. A $1 million price tag has been affixed to the damage. Some of the cars contained highly flammable chemicals like sodium hydroxide. Federal experts are expected to handle the cleanup of those materials. The train apparently hit a semi-trailer truck as it crossed the tracks. The truck driver and the train's engineer suffered minor injuries. Officials say the train was rolling at least 50 miles per hour when it hit the truck. Workmen should finish laying new tracks here tonight so the line can quickly reopen. Tony Stizza, Action 4, north of Edmond. A truckload of 8-track tapes, everything from the best of Willie to the Boston Pops. Some 32,000 tapes neatly packed into boxes, only to be scattered with the rest of the garbage and debris in the dump. Here lie $4.2 million worth of bootleg tapes. The music and songs of stars illegally reproduced by no-name groups and singers. FBI agents had confiscated the pirated tapes from locations in Oklahoma City and Norman last December. Jerry Gregory was arrested and later pleaded guilty to counterfeiting in June. Some of these are very difficult to determine, so we worked closely with the recording industry officials and ended up having to send this to uh, the FBI lab in Washington 
for positive determination, and they have to do this through uh, apparently several methods to determine that it has in fact been uh, copied, and uh, they apparently have some tests that they can determine positively it is not an original tape. Today's destruction is a major setback to the counterfeit market in the area. Other illegal music may be produced in the future, but no one will make any money off of these tapes. Larry Audis, Action 4, Southeast Oklahoma City. Belching clean, odorless natural gas, this well near Cheyenne has been out of control since Wednesday of last week. Workmen snuffed out the 100 feet high flames this morning using almost 90 pounds of dynamite. Blowout specialists headed by Bobby Cudd and Bill Eubank mapped strategy for capping the well. Pressure from deep within the earth blew out the well and a spark from rig equipment ignited the gas. Now the trick is to cap the gas flow without reigniting the well. First thing we're going to do is remove the old burn blowout preventers that's on the well. After we get those removed, why we'll install the new blowout equipment. The danger is it is igniting the well again while we're removing and installing this new iron by a spark or some other source. 30 to 50 million cubic feet of gas a day has been lost since the blowout. That adds up monetarily to a quarter of a million dollars a day. Today, workmen carefully removed the wreckage from the 16,000 feet deep well. They hope to have it capped on Thursday. Tony Stizza, Action 4, southwest of Cheyenne, Oklahoma. Love it. I've been canning. <laughs> Rita Silk Noni was back in court this afternoon for a hearing on the continuance of her appeal bond on her conviction of manslaughter of an airport policeman. The National Council of Churches and the Noni Defense Council had withdrawn Bond late last week, feeling that Noni needed to be in a controlled environment because of emotional problems. District Attorney Bob Macy tried to get the state to drop Bond, saying that Noni was mentally incompetent. But Defense Attorney David Parr said that if that was the case, the state should commit her to a mental institution where she could be helped. Judge William Myers disagreed with both arguments. He said that Noni was awarded the State Corrections Department, and it was not in his authority to commit her but he also saw no reason not to continue bond. Macy was disappointed with the decision and with the proceedings. Uh, I felt that I should have been presented the opportunity to make oral argument. I offered proof through stipulation that Rita Noni had to be committed or was voluntarily committed for a chemical dependency at Norman while she's out on bond. This is definitely a change of condition. And I felt like we should have been heard on it this afternoon. I don't think Rita Noni I should be out on any bond at any time. I don't think he really had any other choice. The bond was set at $100,000, and he left the bond at $100,000. The state will give Rita Silk Noni a little time to produce bond. It is not likely the bond will be paid, and then she will be transferred back to a state facility. That should be in the next few days. Charles Schnitzer, Action 4, at the county courthouse.
yes, I'd like to have my job back, but I don't want to be put on no probational period just to be fired again. <laughs> it don't it don't make no sense. It don't make no sense whatsoever. I can step out just a little bit, you know, be late or uh, anything could happen. What you know? could he do that he has not done? For one thing, listen. Listen. It goes in one ear and goes out the other. He don't he, he acts like he don't care. The FAA is looking for a few good laid-off airline pilots. The controller's strike has forced FAA supervisors to do routine clerical chores, like handling these flight progress trips. The work is time-consuming, so the government wants to hire people with aviation backgrounds to do the job. That would allow controllers more time to handle air traffic. We're Los Angeles. We have J6 Amarillo. The FAA figures out-of-work airline pilots would be ideal for the job, since they're already familiar with aircraft terminology and would require little training. The temporary employees would not go through the FAA's training academy. Nevertheless, supervisors say there would be no compromise in air safety. These are things that these pilots have been involved in ever since they've been flying in the, uh, what we refer to, IFR system. Uh, they're basically reading back to another pilot what he wrote down and uh, confirming it. So uh, it's really no control function involved. The flight data aid job is not the most glamorous position, and the pay isn't all that hot, only about $15,000 a year. But for an out-of-work airline pilot, the job may be just the ticket until the airlines begin hiring again. Scott Wallace, Action 4, Will Rogers World Airport. A great deal of the meeting was closed as they discussed personnel matters. There had been rumors that some of the department's top executives might be fired. State Representative Ross Duckett, the chairman of that House committee investigating the mental health department, says rumors are normal. You know, you hear all kinds of rumors, and especially if there's an ongoing investigation where people have been subpoenaed to appear before the committee and have given testimony. Uh, they worry about uh, retribution and so forth from uh, the Commissioner of Mental Health and others, uh, and there were some rumors as five, but, but there was no one terminated tonight. The only action taken at the meeting was the hiring of an Oklahoma City legal firm, mainly as a consultant on contracts, but also to take a look at the mental health department's options concerning an architectural contract for the proposed mental hospital to be built in Norman. The House Committee is having some problems accepting that contract. We think this is excessive. We think it's significantly excessive. And we have recommended to the Mental Health Committee that the contract should be renegotiated. They hired uh, this firm, uh, and this will be one of their responsibilities to look at their, the legal position of the Department of Mental Health relative to this particular contract. Director Frank James hasn't had a chance to respond to these accusations. He will have his chance this week in front of the House Committee, after which the findings and recommendations of the committee will be issued. Sherry Sellers, Action 4. Why hadn't Mr. Daxon released our audit report on Oklahoma County? I happen to know that we had the best investment policy in the state, the highest percentage of money invested, and the highest rate of interest. And your thing shows that the inventory records are shown as excellent, and my district records are shown as good as the best in the state. And also, we accounted for all mer merchandise bought and where it was used. Now, about these bidding things, you had never even looked at the bidding files till George Tomic told you that we had these files. Uh, my secretary told me your man had never asked for them. And what I would like to know is how could you make intelligent 
assessments without ever having had these bids? First of all, with uh, uh, respect to the bidding files, uh, our people did inquire if bids were present, and they were told by employees in your office uh, that they weren't. Uh, as subsequently, uh, we were told differently, and we have reviewed those bidding files, and as a result of that review, my uh, original position is still, uh, that has not altered uh, anything that, that we came out with originally. Uh, with respect to the release of the audit, uh, many of the statements that you're making here are on target. We are very pleased with the investment uh, program in Oklahoma County and the job that, that Joe Barnes is doing. And well, we've we certainly, gave him the authority to do it. Well, I realize that, and we certainly have never uh, uh, meant to uh, allege otherwise or say that there weren't some good things about the operation of county government in Oklahoma County. But I think as you're aware and, and as most of the viewers are aware, there are some very uh, serious problems in county government across this state. And that has forced a holdup in the release of virtually every uh, uh, county audit that we have underway at the present time. I'm very disappointed to hear this, and I, I am surprised and shocked. The system has been here since the year one, and I think it could be improved. It's just <laughs> kind of surprising. Well, we were sort of disappointed, I guess, you know, but uh, my husband said most, uh, you know, it's been, you know, that type of thing has always been done, so. He didn't think it was all that bad himself. So that's about all I have to say. Oklahoma is not one of the states that has voted in favor of ratifying the Equal Rights Amendment. Nonetheless, women gathered at the state capitol this morning not to rally behind a cause, but to celebrate years of progress for women in the state. The conference was in honor of Oklahoma women in the arts. The keynote speaker, Marilyn Harris, an author from Norman, said she looks forward to the day when the conference can move beyond the barriers of sex and can honor Oklahomans in the arts. Then Governor George Nye reemphasized the state's commitment to equality for all people. The Women's Day at the Capitol is just simply a way of tying a string around our finger to remind us of the commitment we have 365 days out of the year for equal opportunity and equal rights and equal uh, enjoyment of fulfillment of our individual lives. Whether or not the ERA is ratified, the women in Oklahoma are moving forward. And in the last several years, they've developed the momentum that has moved them ahead steps, perhaps leaps at a time. It's a momentum they don't want to lose. Charles Schnitzer, Action 4, at the state capitol.
Well, I see that the positive change now, but back for the last 12 or 15 years, it's been a negative. But it's gradually changing to a positive, and we definitely need a positive change if we're going to maintain our freedom. Two men in their early 20s have been arrested for manufacturing and possessing incendiary devices. Stephen Brumley and Russell Baker were spotted in the Pebble Tree parking lot by an off-duty Oklahoma City police officer moonlighting as a security guard. Officer Jim Hatfield was making his regular rounds when he noticed their suspicious behavior. They were walking around carrying something in their hand and, uh, and rather than acting like, uh, as I would stay as just someone walking through the property, they stopped in several locations and, and had some short conversations and I was unable to hear the conversations and then later they came to the southeast part of the property and sat down. After approaching the two, he found they were not hotel guests, so he asked for some identification. At that time, one of the men tried to knock over a Pepsi bottle that was between his legs. I stopped him from knocking the bottle over and found out that uh, there was rags stuck down in him and there was gasoline inside the uh, Pepsi bottles. Molotov cocktails. About a month ago, three fires were set within a three-hour period in that same area. Two of the fires, one dealing with an automobile and the other a residence, were set by accelerants, such as Molotov cocktails. Brumley and Baker were questioned about these fires, but no additional charges have been made at this time. The two face up to 40 years apiece for manufacturing and possessing an incendiary device, though it's not likely that they will receive the full sentence. One of the men also had a firearm. He was charged with carrying concealed weapon. Sherry Sellers, Action 4. The only reason I got it is because I promised Bell Records at the time before it changed to Arista Records. I promised the people who ran Bell Records that I would go out on tour and I would try and sell the record. But the only reason that I made the record was because I loved being in the recording studio. I, lo I helped Bette make her first two albums. I was in the middle of making commercials and I loved being there. I just loved the control of having an orchestra and singers and, and the sound coming out of those big speakers. I just loved it. I never really wanted to sing. And when I made my own demonstration record, just selling my songs, I was just selling my songs. They bought the whole package, the singer and everything. I didn't. I said, well, listen, why don't you get someone else to sing it, you know? And uh, they said, no, you sing it. And you can, uh, we'll give you money to make another album, to make an album, if you go out and promote it. So I put a tour together and an act together, and I learned how to do it. For years, fishermen have worked the small streams feeding Lake Thunderbird. Each angler had his favorite spot, but careless campers and hikers began leaving their trash behind, and dune buggy drivers rutted out the roads. 
so the federal government decided to fence several areas around the lake. Now, miles of barbed wire and padlock gates keep out pesky polluters. They also keep fishermen like Glenn Watson from practicing their favorite hobby. Well, it just about stopped me fishing down there. It really will, because I just have a small boat, and it's not big enough to run that far up, up, the, lake, up the river. So, uh, and I can't run it in Thunderbird. It ain't big enough for that either with big boats. So, it just shut me off. As usual, the innocent pay for the sins of a few. The fishermen generally are not the ones that uh, leave the trash and, and cause the problems. Uh, but it's going to be necessary to fence off some of these areas out there while the state park uh, implements some erosion control, uh, plant some grass, uh, let the shrubbery recover, and things like this. Peck says the government may reopen the area to vehicles after the vegetation has had a chance to regenerate. In the meantime, some anglers may have to find another favorite fishing hole. Scott Wallace, Action 4 at Lake Thunderbird. So often many people from Oklahoma counties are picking up their daily newspapers and seeing headlines like this. Logan County is the latest. Two county commissioners have retired in what appears to be related to the FBI probe of corruption in county government. Earl Hyden of District 1 officially retired during the county commissioner meeting. Hyden said no more than he was retiring from public service and did not say why. George Davis of District 3 also retired and gave no hint as to his reason. But early reports say he will fight any corruption indictments that may come his way. And what do the residents here think about the retirements? Oh, it surprised me. I wasn't expecting anything like that here. What do you think about the whole county commissioner scandal in general? Pretty bad. Getting to where you can't trust anybody. I, I think that there's something that's been going on for years. And uh, I think it's just now catching up to everybody. It's, I, don't, I doubt that there's a, a county commissioner in the state of Oklahoma or, or in the United States, as far as that goes, that, that hasn't taken kickbacks. And I don't think that this or anything else is going to stop it. I think it will continue even, even though all these people are getting caught at it. The one working county commissioner remaining in Logan County says business can go on as usual with one commissioner, except in one aspect. It takes two county commissioners to sign payroll checks. So unless Governor Nye appoints an interim commissioner before October 1st, it looks like county employees here won't be getting paid. Ed Stewart, Action 4 at the Logan County Courthouse. Thomas Lee Sonny Hayes was sentenced to die for the robbery slain of a Muskogee cobbler in 1977. But execution dates have come and gone, and today the Corrections Department formally canceled another one, October 9th. That was the date a 30-day stay issued by U.S. District Judge Luther Bohannon expired. The State Court of Criminal Appeals turned down the Corrections Department's request for a new execution date because, in all likelihood, it would not have been kept. The uh, Court of Criminal Appeals has hesitated to issue an execution date, probably simply because there's an ongoing appeal in the federal court system. Uh, the issue on that is on the matter of Mr. Hayes' competence. And the, even if this uh, appeal is turned down at the Tenth Circuit level in Denver, there's a very good chance even the attorneys have expressed that they will go to the Supreme Court in Washington should the uh, matter of competence be turned down in Denver. So what we would be having would be an execution date set, a, pr a probable another stay issued out of a federal court, and this would just be a series of, of uh, uh, executions set, stays ordered, and appeals launched by attorneys. And, and what the Court of Appeals has probably done is just wait until the federal process is exhausted before they set another execution date. Nunley points out that because of the heavier caseload, the federal appeals process traditionally takes a lot longer than the state remedies. So it could still be months before Sonny Lee Hayes is finally executed. Ted Brown, Action 4 from the State Department of Corrections.
Don Calvin Tyner, David Smith, and James Earl, all of Oklahoma, along with Lucky DeLay of Irving, Texas, have been charged with using threats to extort the breeding rights of the quarter horse Special Effort. One Oklahoma horseman says Special Effort is one great horse. Special Effort is probably considered by the majority of horsemen today to be the greatest race horse, uh, at least since Easy Jet that we've uh, seen in the breed. He is the first horse that to, to ever win the Triple Crown, the Triple Crown considered to be the uh, Kansas Futurity, the Rainbow Futurity, and the All-American Futurity. Two former employees of Don Tyner's, Vernon Hyde and Michael Blackburn, say the quarter horse broker and his associates tried to force them to return their shares in the $15 million horse. Merle Guile is the attorney representing Tyner and his associates. We feel like uh, this was uh, possibly uh, uh, various motives uh, by these people, these former employees. We feel like they were disgruntled employees, and uh, we're not too sure what their motives were, but we're looking for our, our day in court and vindication of Mr. Tyner here. As a leader in the horse industry, how do you feel about this controversy surrounding special effort? Well, Ben, we're very saddened to have heard about it today. Special effort is a great horse, and we're very sad.